hope everybody's having an absolutely fantastic day. The weather here uh, in Illinois is gorgeous. So it's the best time of the year. There is no mosquitoes. The sun is out. It was 54 degrees this morning. It is absolutely gorgeous. So ultimately when we look through um, everything that's occurring, right? The number one question we're getting when people are calling in right now or I'm meeting with clients is, you know, summed up with what you see on the screen, right? What is going on with the market? And depending what, you know, media outlet you watch or who you're talking to, you get different opinions and there's all these moving pieces that are out there. But really the question is, what is going on with the market? And that's what we're going to dissect today. So I set aside about 20 minutes. Uh, I have a presentation uh, that I've put together uh, in the on the bottom of your screen, those of you that are maybe new to Zoom or haven't used it uh, in a webinar fashion, you can see there's a Q&A button there. You can click on that Q&A button or on the chat feature. And if you have specific questions as I'm going through, I want this to be a very open format. So if you have questions, feel free to type those questions in and I'll go through them right here um, during the presentation. Uh, but like I said, I've, I've set aside about 20 minutes to go through a presentation that I have uh, just to educate all of you and then ultimately happy to go through any questions that you have now. Or if you want to email or call in later, I'm happy to go through them as well. Uh, so let's get started. So the, the main pieces that we're going to talk about today comes down to five main points. Uh, ultimately, the first piece that we're going to touch on is inflation, right? Domestic inflation. And that's inflation here in the United States. With that being said, interest rates are starting to rise. So as interest rates are going up, what does that mean for the economy? What does that mean for the stock market? In addition to that, we have now international inflation. A lot of this started and was really ignited through the volatility we've seen with the Russia and Ukraine conflict. But ultimately, it's causing a lot of international inflation that we need to be aware of. I want to touch on the bond market, right? This is something that is not talked about nearly enough, and it should be talked about a lot as there's a huge bubble that's forming there that we want to make sure we're ahead of. And then finally, what do we need to do going forward, right? What's the outlook? What do we do? How do we stay ahead of these uncertain times? So we're going to touch on those five items. Um, but before we get started, let's take a look at where we are year to date. So you can see on the screen, I've highlighted, this is as of this morning, right? The S&P 500, which are the top 500 stocks or companies in the United States, year to date's down about 15.52%, right? We were approaching all time highs in December. We saw some volatility early on in the first quarter. We actually had a very nice recovery in March. And then ultimately April, uh, in the beginning of May has been extremely volatile, as I'm sure many of you have seen, you know, whether it's through statements, whether it's through the news, et cetera. But just giving you a, a point here, the markets are down about 15.52% for the uh, S&P 500 year to date. You know, the NASDAQ, which is much heavier geared towards growth stocks uh, and ultimately technology is down anywhere from 28 to 30 percent year to date. So it just shows the, the volatility that's occurring out there that we need to be made aware of. So let's start unpacking some of these features with the market and things that we're looking at and really that I want to educate you on. And the first one is inflation here inside the United States. So as you can see, inflation in the U.S., right? Year over year, they call this the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. And it's measuring how much the cost of goods have increased, right? Year over year. And you can see this dates all the way back to 1965. And when you hear on the news that inflation is at the highest level it's been at in 40 years, this is what they're referring to. You can see back in the 70s and 80s, inflation was up over 14%. Right. As of March, right, inflation was up over eight and a half percent from where it was a year ago or a year ago. So we've really seen inflation here in the United States take off. And most people are saying, where did this come from? Why is inflation going up at the pace it's going up? And it's a culmination of different events. But a lot of it was due to the stimulus that we infused into the economy throughout COVID. 
So the economy was doing quite well prior to the COVID outbreak and prior to the shutdowns. In order for the United States economy to continue to do well, the Federal Reserve and ultimately the, the government started to infuse stimulus into individuals' hands. So you think of the stimulus that was infused into the economy the last 18 months in particular. You had multiple rounds of stimulus checks that went out to individuals that qualified. You had a moratorium on evictions. You had forbearance on mortgage payments for up to six months. We still have forbearance on student loans that's in place, right? And then they had the Child Tax Act. And that was where they put basically $300 per child per month into qualifying individuals' hands. So it gave them the ability to make it through COVID and not have to take such a huge financial strain on their family. So some of that was absolutely needed. But if you look back, most of the experts are saying it was too much stimulus that actually went into the marketplace. So just to give you a perspective on what that would look like, you know, let's say that you were a family that had student loans. Well, the average student loan payment in America is about $500 a month. So if your student loans are in forbearance, you don't have to make that payment, right? And there's no interest that's being charged. So ultimately, that's $500 per month of saved cash flow. The average American has about 2.2 children. So if we just round up and said you're a family with three children and the Child Tax Act was paying, that's $300, $600, $900 per month of extra income that's also coming in. So if you take the $500 payment you're no longer making to student loans, plus the $900 in child tax act that occurred six months of last year, that's $1,400 of extra income per month. That's huge, right? So when we look at that in the beginning, right? When we received something like that for the first time, they found that most Americans actually saved it early on right? They put it into their savings account because it's the first time they ever received it. But after you start receiving those payments for a period of time, we start to change our habits because we get used to receiving the money. And they found that after the second month, people started getting used to receiving this extra cash flow and they started to spend it. And when we look at GDP, gross domestic product, that's the measurement of the U.S. economy, Last year, GDP was over 5.3%. That was also the highest level in the last 40 years, which was an indication that people had changed their spending habits and really started to spend that extra cash flow that was coming in. So those are all good things. You hear that, you're saying GDP is high. Isn't that good for the economy? Well, while GDP and spending was up, COVID was still taking place and ultimately was a huge disruption in the supply chain. So if you think about it, right, we couldn't even get things offloaded in the ports fast enough to get onto semi trucks to get to the retail public because people wanted to continue to buy that product. And anytime you have a high demand to buy something, but a very low inventory, that remaining product that's available has to go up in cost. And that's what we were already seeing prior to any Russia, Ukraine issues, prior to any gas prices increasing, et cetera, we were already seeing inflation going to a higher level, okay? What we see from the U.S. economy to curb inflation is they increase interest rates. So the Federal Reserve, right, ultimately meets, and they typically meet every quarter to make decisions on this, and they look at it, and what they do to curb inflation is they increase interest rates, now, when you hear that term, most people don't exactly know what increasing interest rates means. What it means is they're increasing the federal funds rate. They're increasing the rate at which the Federal Reserve loans money to banks. So that means if banks have to pay more interest on their money that they're receiving, they get to charge more interest to their loan holders, to anybody who takes out a mortgage going forward, et cetera. And most people say, well, if interest rates are going up, how does that stop or slow down inflation, right? Which is a very strong question, right? How does that slow down inflation? So put yourself in the average American shoes. Let's say that you have some credit card debt 
and you're making just the minimum payment currently, right? I don't like that. I don't advise that. But let's say that you're just making the minimum payment. And let's say that your interest rate is 19% on your credit card. Well, if interest rates go up and all of a sudden the federal funds rate increases, that means your credit card is now going to charge you more interest. So your minimum payment that you're making has to also go up because you're paying more interest on that credit card every single month. That means you have less cash flow left over to buy products and items that you normally would be purchasing right? So your desire to buy things starts to come down. And ultimately, the supply chain can catch back up, right? And ultimately, if the supply chain is refilling, and the demand is lower, the cost of the product will start to come down. So that's one way that an interest rates going up curbs inflation. Another way that it, it curbs it is ultimately, it starts to make things more expensive for individuals where they can no longer afford it. So think about homes, for example, right? If you were purchasing a home and you had a 2% 30-year fixed mortgage, let's say, for example, which is fantastic, right? If you got that rate. So let's say you were paying 2% interest, you can afford a larger home because you're paying less interest to the bank. If those mortgage rates jump up to, you know, 5 6%, which is where we're headed, right? That means you can start to afford less home for your same payment because ultimately you're paying more interest to the institution and less towards principal. So the amount of home that you can afford, right, starts to come down and ultimately that starts to put more downward pressure on those real assets such as homes and so forth. So that's where interest rates going up does have a very sharp reaction with inflation traditionally. Okay, and that's the key word is traditionally, because we are not in a traditional market right now. So as you can see on the screen here, you know, the Federal Reserve has increased interest rates two times year to date. They did a quarter percent rate increase earlier in the year, and they just raised rates a half percent. You can see over the last two decades, right, we're still in a very low interest rate environment. We have just been in a historically low rate period since 2007, 2008. So we're not used to seeing these rates increase and we're not used to seeing them increase as sharply as they're increasing right now to try and get ahead of inflation. And same thing, just as a reminder, if you have any questions as I go through here, just pop it into the chat feature on the bottom. We'll click it and we'll go through questions more in detail as well. So that's interest rates going up. And I'll bring this all full circle uh, to explain through what that means and what we need to be looking at going forward. The third piece, and this is really the monkey wrench that got thrown into things, is international inflation. If it was just the United States, if inflation was only high in the United States, interest rates going up would have a very stark reaction to bring inflation down rapidly. And historically, that has been the ammunition and the go-to for the Federal Reserve to stay on top of inflation, right? Because inflation is an indication that the economy is overheating. People are spending, 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 and the supply can't keep up, right? When they raise interest rates, they're strategically slowing down the economy because you can afford less items. So it would have a pretty stark re reaction on inflation in a normal economy. Russia invading Ukraine, right? has caused sanctions to be placed um, throughout the allies, right? Throughout the European Union, throughout the United States, throughout different allies against Russia. And ultimately what's that, what that has done is it's created a trickle down effect of other forms of inflation that interest rates going up cannot control. So you can see the picture on here, which is gas prices. And that's something we're all feeling right now is an increase in gas, right? Gas has really spiked because ultimately one of the largest world distributors or exporters of gas or oil is Russia, right? Well, if we're sanctioning Russia and the European Union is sanctioning Russia, they're no longer purchasing that oil or they're purchasing a lower amount of that oil. That creates a world shortage. And ultimately, you start to see that gasoline or oil price increase. 
As that increases, I want you to just think of this question, okay? If the Federal Reserve increases interest rates in the United States, does that have any impact on oil prices internationally or the United States? And the answer is no. It has no impact on where oil prices are. And if oil prices go higher, that means any of the distributors, any of the semis or logistic companies that have to get the product from point A to point B, they have to charge more, which means the product also goes up in cost. So international inflation is putting this, this anchor out there that says we can increase interest rates and help curb some of the inflation in the United States, but not all of it. In addition to that, we're a global economy now. And that's a, a key piece, right? If you look back at historical data, right, a lot of it was just country by country. The, it's a world economy at this point. And where this really takes hold is, you know, we import very little natural gas from Russia, but Germany, right? And we import products from Germany and Europe, right? They import the majority of their natural gas from Russia. Well, with the sanctions that are in place, Russia is talking about increasing natural gas somewhere between 300% to 800% on those European countries. If they do that, that means the expense for them to manufacture or make products in the Europe and Germany is going to go up, which means when we're importing their products, we have to pay more money for those because ultimately it costs them more money to make it. So you can see where it really does create a trickle down effect because it's a world economy that's out there. Right. So that's the international inflation piece that we have to continue to monitor and watch. And a lot of that was driven by Russia invading Ukraine because it spiked a lot of these costs that we weren't anticipating. The other piece that I'll touch on with this is food. Ukraine is one of the leading exporters of wheat and barley in the world. So, you know, 19 percent of the world's wheat production comes out of Ukraine. They're working very diligently right now to try and open the ports to allow food exports to go out. So there's not a food shortage, because if there's a shortage of food, you'll see food prices continue to spike higher. And that hits our pockets for the everyday American as well. So also things to continue to, to watch for. The fourth piece I want to touch on is the bond market. OK, so when we look at the bond market, this right here that you're looking at is the number one used bond fund in the United States. OK, so I'm not going to put the ticker symbol up here. I'm not going to put the name up here, but this is the number one used bond fund in the United States. And you can see year to date, it's down about 10.25 percent. So most people, when I ask them and I say, are bonds conservative? or aggressive traditionally, most people automatically shout out conservative, right? Bonds are, are what they call fixed income, right? It, it has to be more conservative, but not all bonds are created equal. And that's a big piece and nobody's talking about this. So bonds work inverse of interest rates. So if my arm's a teeter-totter and interest rates increase, what do bond prices do, right? They fall. And every time you see interest rates continue to increase, they continue to fall further. So as you can see, we've had two rate increases year to date. The first rate increase, you can see the drop. The second rate increase, you can see the further drop. So this is the safe money that most people that are retired or going into retirement, okay, think, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take money out of, the, out of stocks or equities, and I'm going to put it over here in fixed income. And traditionally, it would be more conservative. But when's the last time we've had historically low interest rates for over a decade like we have? And now we're starting to see them increase, right? Never. We've never seen them held that low for that long. So it's creating this perfect storm in the bond market, where as rates continue to increase, we're going to continue to see these types of return on what people think is their safe money. Right, Clients that we're working with right now, we're not holding the intermediate term, the long-term bonds, et cetera, and we're limiting that volatility. Not all bonds are bad. That's not at all what I'm saying. But if you're holding the wrong type, and most people are, right? most people are, 
they're getting burned very heavily on what they think are very safe investments. So definitely something to review. If any of you have questions, ultimately you can reach out to me or send me an email. I'm happy to go through those with you as we continue to stay ahead of that curve. As interest rates continue to rise, the bond market will continue to struggle. That's a key takeaway that we need to remember. So what do we do, right? This is a question that we get out there. I just went through four items. I went through domestic inflation, right? Inflation in the United States going up. I went through interest rates rising. I went through international inflation, and then I showed you the bond market. And you see all of those and you say, you know what, Tyler, that doesn't sound like a lot of good stuff. And I totally get that because you're saying, you know, things are more expensive, gas is high, interest rates are going up if you wanted to buy a house, et cetera. Inflation is not a bad thing, okay? Normal inflation is not a bad thing. Hyperinflation is. And right now we're seeing more on the hyperinflation side where things are going up pretty exponentially. The Federal Reserve, right, is working very, very hard to get ahead of that. And they've committed to reducing inflation. So I do think inflation will start to come down over the next 12 to 18 months. We saw it at its peak at eight and a half percent when they came out with the CPA, CPI report in April, it was down to 8.3. So we did see it cool a bit with the first interest rate increase. And I think you're going to see some people change their habits, right? If gas continues to rise, you're going to see less and less people driving, taking those road trips, taking those vacations, and you're going to see more people continuing to work from home, right? It also is pushing people more towards the renewable energy side, because ultimately there was a huge price gap into what it costs to make biofuels at the green side. Um, a year ago, when you could buy fuel for, let's say, $2.20, and biofuel was about $5.15, well, now that regular fuel has increased, biofuel is more affordable. So we'll see a push that way. Uh, I'm getting down a rabbit hole and a tangent here, so I'm going to bring it back. Um, but ultimately, what I want you to take away with regards to inflation is most of the people that are on this webinar right now are people that are pre-retired or retired. You hold assets. Inflation on your hard assets, such as your home or a vacation property, cars, etc., is actually increasing your net worth. The people that will struggle during times of even normal inflation are those that are just getting started or those that are looking to buy assets. So for example, if you don't have a mortgage, right, and you don't have any reoccurring credit card debt, interest rates going up on mortgages means nothing to you. It has no impact on you. And as home prices continue to go up, you're not buying a home. You own your home and it's paid for. So that means your home is actually worth more money and it's increasing your net worth. So inflation is actually working in your favor in that example. But I want you to think of somebody who might be 25 years old and they wanna buy a house. Well, it becomes more and more difficult for that individual because all of a sudden mortgage rates are at 6% and they can afford less home, but home prices are elevating so they have to pay more money, which takes more of their cash flow. You can see it starts to create a divide and a separation. But the individuals on this call, inflation in a lot of ways, if you have hard assets, right, homes and so forth, is increasing your bottom line and your net worth, which is a good thing. That's working in your favor. Okay. When we look at what to do, right, going forward with all these pieces, we want to stay away from cyclical sectors. So cyclical sectors, by definition, are items or things that are not necessities right? They're a non-necessity. So you don't have to have it. So if cash flow gets really, really tight and you wanted to go on a vacation and you wanted to go on a Disney cruise, let's say, right? And all of a sudden that Disney cruise goes up 30% in cost, you're probably going to put that vacation off. It's just too expensive. We don't have to have it. We don't have to do it. It's a non-essential, okay? You want to stay away from those. You want to look at the things that you have to have regardless of the state of the economy, number one, and regardless of the price of the product, number two, okay? So for example, a lot of you have heard this joke when I say it, but if toilet paper goes up a dollar per pack, you're still gonna buy it, right? It's one of those companies or items that you have to purchase regardless of the price and the company will bake their profit margin directly into that, 
I'll give you another example, right? Utilities and energy. The last 10 years, utilities and energy, which are two sectors in the S&P, are some of the most boring sectors, right, compared to tech companies and things like that over the last 10-year period. But when's the last time you got to negotiate your light bill or your water bill, right? Never. You don't get to negotiate it at all. Those two sectors are actually positive year to date. So you've seen utilities slightly up. Energy sector is up over 30% year to date. Right. And many of you on this call are actually holding both of those sectors, which helps limit that volatility. So you want to stay with the necessities that are in place in the companies that can price in the inflationary raises right into their profit margin and individuals still have to buy the product. That's how you insulate yourself during these uncertain times. You're never going to be able to fully remove all the volatility of the market but we can reduce it dramatically by going into those staples, right? And many of you, I'm sure if you looked at your portfolios are seeing just that, and I'm happy to go through that with you, but ultimately it helps limit that downside dramatically. And those companies also pay a really nice dividend along the way. And that's what we try and live off of is that dividend income. So we can insulate ourselves from needing to deplete anything or taking principal out of the account. So Overall, we want to stay with those staples during times of inflation. And I'm anticipating inflation to stay high for at least the next 12 to 18 months. I mean, when you look at all the factors that are out there, we may see it start to come down. But ultimately, I am anticipating it to stay high at least the next 12 to 18 months, which means we want to continue to be in those companies that will profit and do well during that time. Same thing on the bond market. Right? The bond market, we always have to continue to do a review. If you're in an intermediate term or long-term bond, right? if my arm is that teeter-totter, short duration bonds are right at the axis point. They don't have a lot of volatility or a lot of bearing if interest rates go up or down because the duration is so short. But intermediate term or long-term, right? the higher interest rates go, the more they fall. So ultimately, that is definitely something to review if you have accounts outside of us or you have no people that have bonds, right? I've been going through 401ks with individuals in reviewing their allocations. And in most allocations, they put you into a lifestyle fund or a target fund, right? So for example, you know, I just reviewed someone's account and they have the target 2025 fund, right? They are, they are planning on retiring right around 2025. Most 401ks list that out there. And the closer you get to 2025, the more conservative they make that allocation automatically. And when they say that, what they're doing is they're taking money out of equities and pushing it over into the fixed income side, right? Well, I just told you that bonds can be a big bubble right now, if not looked at proportionately. So when we reviewed that, they saw the same exact cliff that I had just described. So that's something to get ahead of and make sure that you're getting out of and getting into something that's going to uh, get you a better return long term for what you're looking for. So um, in a nutshell, inflation can be a good thing when it's normal inflation. And as long as you're not purchasing into items um, such as high variable rate credit cards, you know, buying you know, new homes, things like that. If you have assets, inflation is actually working to your benefit. Number two, right? Not all bonds are created equal. We need to make sure that we stay ahead of that as that bubble continues to form. And then number three, we want to stay away from cyclical items right now. And we ultimately want to continue to focus on those staples that are pricing in those rate increases uh, through inflation, and you can benefit from it. And then the last piece is if you are looking to invest, you want to invest when the market's down, not when it's at a high, it's your mindset, okay? And I'm not telling you to go dump all your money into the stock market right now or anything like that. But what I'm saying is I sat down with a client and we were doing a plan for assets that he wanted to ultimately gift to his grandkids about 20 years from now. And I joked with him because he wanted to invest when the market was at 37,000 in the Dow. And I said, let's wait for a bit of some volatility. But he was fully committed when the Dow was at 37,000. The Dow went down to roughly 32,000, which is almost a 20% decrease. And he did not want to invest. When I told him now is the time because we were waiting for a dip because he was nervous. 
And I said, if you were fully committed and comfortable at 37,000, you should be doing backflips and celebrating because you're buying the same companies that you wanted to at a 20% discount. You should be excited about that. And you're not going to touch that money for a 20 year time period. So it comes down to reframing our thought process for the long term. And just remember, Warren Buffett always said, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful, right? And that's the mindset we have to have long term. Things will get better, right? Ultimately, inflation will not stay at these levels forever. And, you know, we're going to continue to see growth in the good companies that you're invested in. So with that being said, that's the, the presentation that I put together. Does anyone on here have any questions at all that they'd like me to go through uh, just in general. So remember, you can click on the bottom on the, either the Q&A tab or under the chat section, and you can send over any questions that you have, uh, and I'm happy to go through them. So we'll give it a couple minutes here for people to type in any questions they might have. Looks like someone's typing a question right here. What do I anticipate mortgage interest rates to be uh, in the next year? You know, that's a really good question. So mortgage interest rates uh, have increased higher and faster than what most experts have anticipated. So most experts, if you look back even a year ago, they were anticipating mortgage rates to be around four to four and a half percent right now based on the interest rates that we've seen. Okay, so they've increased much quicker than were originally anticipated. Um, and some of that is just with the anticipation that they're going to continue to, to rise, right? They're going to continue to ratchet up interest rates. Um, so, you know, we could see mortgage rates being in the, you know, five and a half, six and a half percent range at the end of this year from a 30 year fixed standpoint. I would not be surprised with that. Do I think that they're going to stay there? That, that I don't know. But ultimately, we could see them continue to rise as they continue to do the half percent or you know more rate increases throughout the rest of the year. So just to answer that question, yeah, I mean, ultimately, we would start to see rates continue to uh, accelerate here in the short term. All right. In your opinion, would gas prices go down if we reopen pipelines that were closed by the administration? So I'm laughing because I get that question a lot. So I'm going to stay neutral on the political side, uh, but ultimately I will, uh, I will address the question. So we'll go in a supply and demand standpoint, okay? So obviously if we increased the supply of oil that was in the marketplace or available for individuals, you would see prices decrease, right? Because we would have a supply. So when we when we sanctioned Russia, when I say we, US and our allies sanctioned Russia, we're no longer purchasing some of the goods they provided and that created a global shortage. So one of the things we've done is we've started as a, as a nation to release from our strategic oil reserves, you know, millions and millions of barrels of oil to try and slow down the increase we would see uh, at the pump. Well, that works to an extent, but ultimately it can only carry us so far. If we increase the global supply across the board to more replace what Russia was exporting, then ultimately, yes, it would put a more of a downward pressure on gas prices. And we would most likely see those start to come down uh, to some extent. I hope I, hope I uh, answered that question. With rising rates along with goods and services, how do people on a fixed income address this issue? It's a really good question. So it's a common question that we get. So, you know, many of you uh, are already clients and you've heard of, you know, the growth and income type strategy. So when we're mapping out for retirees, we're looking at what guaranteed income sources you have and where you're taking income from now. And then ultimately, we have assets that are accumulating in the background. Most of those are dividend focused in some capacity. And remember that dividends pay regardless of the share price. It's based on the number of shares you own. So we can turn that faucet on to have those dividends paid to you rather than be reinvested to ultimately continue to give you that raise 
as inflation is and expenses continue to go up, right? So we want to make sure that we have assets accumulating in the background to be able to give us raises during these times of inflation. Because if you don't have that set up, it can get very, very tight, right? I think of my grandmother, for example, she lived off just Social Security, right? And I was just talking to Amber, my wife, last week, and I said, I, I'm not sure how she would have made it or other people that are just living off of $1,200 a month and Social Security could make it when gas is $5 a gallon. And, you know, the, the short answer to that is long term, they can't. So, you know, many of us are just so blessed to be born in the United States and be here in the United States and have the things that we have. But ultimately, you know, for those individuals that were tight before, inflation can be a really, really significant uh, problem going forward. Uh, and like I said, that's why the Federal Reserve is so aggressively trying to get ahead of that. Any other questions that anybody has here? I'm just opening up the chat tab here. All right, I did not see anything else come through. So uh, if you guys do have individual questions, please feel free to shoot me an email or a phone call. Uh, happy to go through them in detail. Um, or call any of the advisors here at the Trinell Financial Group, uh, as that's what we're here for. I appreciate you all taking this time uh, to go through this with us. I thought it would go about 30 minutes. It went 38 minutes. So sorry, I got a little long-winded. Uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your day and uh, take care.